Welcome to Where Parents Talk. My name is Leanne Castellino. Our guest today is a globally renowned researcher in the area of social and psychological resilience. Dr. Michael Unger is Canada Research Chair in Child, Family and Community Resilience. He's a family therapist and director of the Resilience Research Center at Dalhousie University in Halifax. Dr. Unger has authored more than a dozen books on resilience. His latest book is called The Limits of Resilience, When to Persevere, When to Change, and When to Quit. Dr. Unger is also a father of five, and he joins us today from just outside Toronto. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, a real pleasure. Thank you. You've been on the front lines of resilience research now for decades. Resilience itself seemingly has really become part of our vernacular in the last few years, you could say. What has led to it becoming such a buzzword that it currently is? I think what people have done is they've been searching for a balance to our conversation about trauma. Um, as you know, given world circumstances, whether we're talking about refugees, the climate crisis, or we're talking about our greater awareness of racism, our greater awareness of domestic violence. These are all issues I think that have focused on the, on, on if you will, the pathology, the disorders in our society. But with that, I think has also come this desire to say, well, well, what's next? How do we protect ourselves from some of those tragic moments? And in fact, you know, I, I defer to folks, you know, George Bonanno uses the phrase, potentially traumatizing event, which I think opens up a conversation that says, you know, just because we're exposed to these things doesn't mean that within that realm of human experience, it, it's always debilitating for a long period of time. Um, and that, you know, within us, we have these um, uh, with built-in protective mechanisms at all kinds of different systemic levels, but we also live inside communities and cultures um, that you know, there are things that lift us up and get us through a crisis. And I think that's been the conversation that people are also looking for. So along those lines, then, when you talk about trauma, and certainly we're exposed to more of that uh, today than we ever have been, it seems like anyway, are we misusing or abusing the word resilience in your estimation? Well, when something becomes popular, you love it because you know that the conversation is happening. But with that has also come some definitional slippage, if you will. The, the, the book Limits of Resilience actually started with, I mean, I think the idea had been there in my mind, but when I really put pen to paper or computer, I guess, typed it, <laughs> was after hearing about the after effects of one of the hurricanes that devastated the uh, Florida coastline. I mean, this is horrific to any community to experience that sort of dramatic uh, onslaught from nature. And we have them where I live in Halifax as well. But it was the way the um, uh, the commentator on the newscast kind of talked about that, you know, the folks with very expensive, you know, very expensive homes, right, right on the sand, practically on the sandbars, right next to the ocean. And he said, you know, these communities are resilient because people will rebuild and I thought to myself, whoa, have we misunderstood that concept? Because resilience wasn't about, in a sense, just doing the same thing over and over again. Resilience really refers to a system of learning, of growth and adaptation, and an ultimately transformation as well. And so my advice to that community where people were rebuilding their homes exactly in the same space that the hurricane had wiped them out, was that that's not resilience. That's in fact, perhaps a sign of vulnerability or persistence when more information should have maybe informed people that look, like it or not, deny if you want, our climate is dramatically changing and those coastal communities are gonna be in much more uh, you know, um, uh, in dangerous state for the coming decades, so that rebuilding maybe a little more inland, or you know, changing our lifestyle slightly to accommodate that is this is the actual resilience. Simply rebuilding on the floodplain where your home is going to be you know devastated yet again is probably not a sign of resilience, but in fact maybe. Um, you know, sort of distorted thinking or, you know, uh, that that somehow you're impervious. And in fact, there is this kind of 
toxic positivity, which has taken over the field of resilience, where we just overestimate our ability to bounce back. When in fact, what we fail to see is that our capacity to recover or bounce back is tied up with other systems as well. And that's where the field of resilience actually is going now. It's such an interesting example that you provide because you know, we hear those similar examples all the time these days, right? And so uh, the more you say it doesn't make it more right, but it's just a really interesting example. I'm curious, Dr. Unger, as a family therapist, you know, in your clinical practice, what have you seen in terms of trends with the families, the children, the parents that you are, are dealing with as it relates to how they address resilience in their own homes as parents or not? So this is, you could take almost exactly the same parallel of, so a family um, where they sometimes forget that, you know, it's a dynamic between we need the right amount of risk in our lives and we need the right solutions. So it, somewhat differently, but we also see now in families, um, I see this common, this overprotective parenting where we have taken away all risk exposure to our kids. We're making all, every decision for our child. And what that's done is that's removed the opportunity for children to, again, to learn. If you know, if those homeowners had to, in a sense, learn from the experience, we, not, we need our children to also integrate into their lives a certain amount of, um, I don't know if this is a family-oriented show, but can I use the four-letter F word? Because it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the F bomb when it comes up to it, because we need children to fail. There, I said it, you know, that that's the thing. We occasionally need our children to actually fail and integrate that learning, especially when we're available to, you know, scaffold the experience and build them up again with the skill set they need to overcome the problem. So what I'm really, what we're really getting at from a family point of view also is um, integrating learning, helping children, you know, develop the skills and, 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 and you know, th that they need to cope with future stressors so that we can address the fact that what we're seeing is this huge spike in anxiety disorders and depression amongst our children. And part of that has to be attributed, not, not just to the lingering after effects of COVID and social isolation, but I do think there's also something about how we're parenting. Are we, you know, giving kids the, the, the building blocks they need to develop real resilience, that ability to, you know, to integrate experience, learn from mistakes, move forward and develop new coping strategies. And sadly, I don't know if we're doing that enough. What should we be doing more than as parents? <laughs> well, I think what we should be doing with kids, of course, is giving them opportunities to have age appropriate stress in their lives. So, you know, when the, when the eight year old, we're taking them to, you know, soccer practice or something, why are we packing their their bag? Why why aren't you know why, why aren't we asking them to sort of get their kit together? Why aren't we giving them genuine responsibilities with a pet in the home? Why aren't we asking them to you know when a when a thirteen year old says you know something's happened with my teacher? Why aren't we helping them to you know coaching them on what to say, but letting them deal with the teacher? Why, you know, in a sense, why aren't we giving our kids the building blocks so that they can move easier towards independence and eventually um, cope well with some of the stressors that they're bound to occur later in their lives? It's interesting because helicopter parenting and that protective parenting that you're talking about just seems to be continuing to, to trend upwards. I'm not a, a researcher, but... And then right. you add all the traumas that you just discussed um, and outlined with respect to, you know, the pandemic, the global epidemic of youth mental health and mental health in general, you know, war, uh, geopolitical instability and volatility, yeah. economic uncertainty. There's a litany of things for all of us to worry about and then to talk about being resilient uh, for or as a result of so why are we doing this as parents uh, still, do you think? Well, I think it's a little bit from the parents I talk to, it's often about our own insecurities, that somehow we're just so set on our child, you know, being an extension of us and being successful, that we forget that actually, you know, for all of that mania that we're, you know, putting on our children, we might be missing the key thing that they actually need which is to develop the competencies that they need to be, you know, caring contributors to their communities and good citizens. And that comes with, you know, making them sometimes feel uncomfortable. 
Um, I think we've, as parents, I think we've kind of said, well, I don't want to feel uncomfortable and I certainly don't want to, my child to ever feel that way. Um, but this comes back to rather than focusing on the long-term objective of a child that understands and experiences resilience, what we're so focused on is the moment of, you know, that, that, that immediate moment where, oh my gosh, we don't want them to ever have a threat to their self-esteem, but actually we want them to have threats to their self-esteem. We don't want to be there, you know, uh, when they're five years old and they're at a practice for soccer, staying on that one for a second. We don't want to be their cheerleader in the in the stands every time they touch the ball, going crazy. Oh, look at that. Yeah, go, go, go. Well, no, that's in disproportion, out of proportion to what the child has actually done. You want to go, okay, that was a good game or a good practice. You, you know, you're learning your skills and let's go home. <laughs> like, you know, now if it's the final game of the season and they actually score the final goal, you go you know, yay, it's great. But I think somehow, you know, we have created a vulnerability in our children. And I think sometimes this, this notion of endless talk about resilience uh, kind of goes against actually what the term is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be when we are stressed in a way that's not normal. It's about recovering from that or growing from that experience. And that opens up a very different conversation about what kids need. They don't just need a constant hurrah. They need sometimes an opportunity to be reflective and realize that they've made a mistake and get together the skills they need to actually get through that. Your book is called The Limits of Resilience. And I wonder why do you believe it is important to consider uh, the limited uh, limits of resilience? Yeah. So when, when, when one actually looks at the research, you, you do see patterns, different kinds of ways that societies and families and individuals show resilience. I mean, everything from, you know, if you're, Leanne, if, if, if you're protected, if you're in a system where everyone around you is kind of just, you know, coddling you like an overprotected child, then you can just persevere with very odd behaviors. You can be a very anxious child, what we sometimes refer to as an orchid, you know, a very delicate creature it, because everyone around you protects you from any adversity. You never, you know, you, you know, you don't like to stand up and public speak. So your teacher is given a note from your parents and say, well, you never have to be in front of the class. You never have to have a question called upon you. And that works as long as the world is a constant cotton wool around you and nobody ever, you know, gets you flustered. But that is not a long-term strategy for success, nor is sort of, we see another pattern where people resist. Well, you know, you get these people who their, their pattern of resilience is just to constantly be negative and pushing back. And it's not necessarily constructive. It's just like, I'm going to just constantly fight back to anyone who wants to make me change. I'm, I'm only good at this. We see this in communities and sometimes families, right? That, you know, we're, we're, we've always done this for 100 years. Our generations have done this and gosh, darn, it's going to be like that forevermore. And you kind of go, well, you know, that's not really a good strategy. If the world is changing, you can keep resisting it. But at some point, maybe you want to integrate some of what's new. And then of course, you know, we, we get people talking just about recovery, which is, you know, getting back to where, how they were, which isn't always possible. But then of course, in a more productive way, we also know that individuals, families, communities, they adapt, they begin to sort of see new realities and new technologies, and they begin to integrate those into their lives. And of course, they also transform. You know, we literally change the systems around us to, to better accommodate uh, us so that we can have new ways of thriving. And each of those strategies people use depending on how they feel and the resources they have. Um, but I do think sometimes that we, we, we persist too long. We, we, you know, the homeowner who keeps building in exactly the same spot rather than looking for a more transformational way of thinking about our housing and our land, or maybe I know it's very political, but do you begin to, you know, maybe say, well, these once in a thousand year storms are now happening every five years. Maybe something has shifted and we need to revisit our, our belief systems. Uh, what's sometimes referred to as second order thinking. We need to revisit what the way we think about this. And maybe the problem isn't just my house. It's actually the climate or something like that. So, so suddenly, you know, our resilience is tied up with a lot of other systems, whether it's the municipal council that's voting, whether or not to build a three foot dike 
or, you know, a seawall or a 18 foot seawall. One is very expensive and is going to influence our taxes on our house, but one is probably a little more in tune with what's actually happening if we're if we're willing to admit that there are other changes going on in other systems. It's the same thing for a parent that says, you know, I want my kid in 12 activities so they can go to some Ivy League school, when in fact what they might have is a child who just would like one activity. And again, I constantly am trying to get people to understand that the resilience of any single individual is really wrapped up with the, the resilience of the other systems around them and how those systems interact. So a child that needs a lot of calm isn't going to do very well in a family that's hyperactive about 12 activities and vice versa. The highly active, you know, the active child that's just go, 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 isn't going to do well with the, with the family that says, well, we're not into formal activities at all. And, you know, so we're always in this constant dance. Our resilience is tied up to the resilience of, well, other systems around us. And, and if I might, that opens up opportunities. So if I want to improve my resilience, maybe I can stop beating myself up. Oh, I didn't get to the gym. I didn't diet. I didn't, you know, finish that exam. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. Because maybe part of the reason why I didn't succeed at that was because some of the other, you know, these other sources of support around me weren't functioning very well either. It really does change the whole approach when you put it that way in terms of how you think about it, certainly. So Dr. Unger, when is persevering or being persistent or being resilient not optimal? Could you give us some examples um, and certainly as they pertain to, to parents and kids? Well, you know, even Angela Duckworth and her work on grit years back now, you know, she never beat up the people who dropped out of some elite you know, military force training. She kind of saw that as integrating learning. People, you know, some of her studies were based on these soldiers that would go through some sort of elite, you know, training to, to be special ops or whatever it was. And, you know, the idea of perseverance was the folks that could get through that training. But 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 people who dropped out weren't somehow lesser individuals. They had just simply understood that that pathway wasn't really great for them. And I'm, in the limits of resilience, I do give lots of examples, but I mean, you know, you do hear stories about like, you know, I had, I was working with someone who was there, you know, they were going to go to medical school no matter what. And they just kept persevering and they kept not getting into medical school. Now, once you try and you fail, you retool, you go, that's good perseverance, maybe a third time. But after a third time not getting in, you might want to say, what is it about medical school that I'm trying so desperately to have? Is it the status? Is it the helping others? What is it? The same person might have done very well in maybe as a physiotherapist, if they still wanted to be in medical, where maybe the credentialing isn't quite so, you know, it's not the, the gatekeeping isn't so harsh. Maybe they wanted to go into a nursing, which is probably a little bit easier to get into. Maybe they wanted, maybe they would have become um, very good at something um, using a biology degree to become a farm, a, a farmer, a, a pharmacy rep or something like, uh, you know, this type of thing. There's lots of other options, but when you just persist at some point, persistence is not serving you well and change or even transformation in your values or your belief systems may have actually led to more happiness. So that's when persistence, despite all our extolling the virtues of grit at some point, persisting into something that might not even make you that happy or be a good fit or leave you vulnerable is not necessarily where persistence is a good idea. So building on that point, what types of behavior then can somebody get locked into um, if they persevere for too long or blindly? I think it's what happens is that people sometimes fail to acknowledge the other systems that are operating this hyper individualism we sometimes have that oh well if i just persist and somebody's going to take me kind of you know ignores the fact that out there there are other systems whether they're you know it's racism it's structural violence it's the economy we've been doing a lot of work for instance in oil and gas communities where there is, you know, where the green revolution of, you know, the way we're moving towards, you know, um, carbon neutral energy sources is going to have a dramatic impact on communities that had previously relied on coal and oil and gas production. Now, that's, you know, 
there's debate about if this is a, a 10 year or a 50 year transformation, but something eventually is going to happen. And inside those communities, you're, you're really talking about can a community or can individuals in those communities begin to make decisions with some understanding of the world price of carbon production, of oil and gas world prices, or, or whether or not Tesla stocks are going up and down and electric cars are getting adopted or not adopted. I mean, these might, you're, I know we're talking about individuals and now I'm talking about macroeconomic factors. It's like, what is this guy talking about? But what we actually saw in our own research was that people were making decisions at a family, at an individual level about career paths, but whether or not a child is in, is in a sporting activity at the local rec center, largely based on something like macroeconomic conditions that were then affecting the job prospects for a family and whether or not a parent was even going to be at home to take their kid to that hockey practice because whether or not they're actually having to change communities and move away and all the money that it takes to have a kid in these activities. So on one level, for us to sit here and say, you know, I want my kid to play hockey, belies the fact that I also have to think about some of these other things that are going on and indeed, so the diversification of the economy in a community like that is actually going to somehow protect the value of my home, is going to protect my job. So suddenly our municipal council making decisions about things like seawalls and whether or not we invest in some uh, 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 different industries in our town, those things have direct impact on what kids experience in a home. This, I know it sounds a bit complicated, but what it does is it takes away that responsibility for us to individually be resilient. And now suddenly we're embedded in other systems and maybe we can stop blaming ourselves for our situation. And maybe we can begin to see that our choices are in sense, our resilience is tied up with the resilience of our, you know, politics and our communities and our neighbors. Um, and, you know, that we're all sort of linked more together and maybe that opens up more possibilities for us to be successful rather than fewer. You've talked about, you know, doing something maybe once, twice or three times and not succeeding. And then maybe it's time to adopt a new path. How can one discern when it is time to quit <laughs> entirely and just move on to something completely different? I, I think generally speaking, if you if you're experiencing um, repeated failures where it feels very much beyond your control to fix, then you might need another pathway, right? And that's as applicable again to a business. I mean, you know, Kodak, believe it or not, had a camera, a digital camera decades before they became popular, but it was stuck in that rut of persevering with one product line it made film. It saw itself just as that identity as a film producing company. And I think people do the same thing. You know, we get so stuck in, well, everyone in my family was a doctor, so I'm going to become a doctor, even if the kid really would rather be an artist or maybe a plumber or a carpenter or something with, you know, their hand, using their hands in a very different way. But families develop cultures of, you know, expectations. So I always say that when something doesn't feel quite right or it continuously creates stress or problems, it's probably time to maybe think not just about persevering, but maybe quitting is a better strategy to make keep our mental health, you know, um, feeling better about who we are and what we what we do. I've worked with so many children, especially if, say families of recent you know newcomers, where the first generation is almost you know forced like you know you are going to become and it's usually finished with some professional identity right because the parents are so wrapped up in uh, you know taking advantage of the opportunities in you know in the societies that they migrated to and that can be great and kids need to be motivated and it's nothing wrong with that but sometimes you know it it's out of touch with a particular child that would be better off rather than a university education they might be better off with a trade and in fact, might earn more money in the long term if they opened up a small uh, their own business as a you know a bricklayer or a plumber or an electrician. Given what electricians are in these days, it might be a really good choice rather than getting a bachelor of arts. Um, so we forget that 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 you know the, as the world changes and maybe the, there's a bad fit, that's usually a good time to think about quitting and indeed maybe 
changing, moving into something completely new. Is there anything that you uncovered in the course of the research for the limits of resilience that struck you in particular? Yeah, I, I'd say that the one conversation that we have failed to have is the cost of resilience. There is an emerging body of research that actually shows that, you know, when we persist for too long and we, you know, we, we accommodate our way to stress, there are studies of people who are exposed to constant, you know, bombardment, say in a war situation, um, um, or indeed uh, families who are, you know, growing up amid racism in U.S. Co other countries as well, have shown that 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 resilience, that ability to keep persisting and going and succeeding and getting on to college or whatever, what the, what. People like Gene Brody have described it as skin deep resilience. In other words, it's on the surface, but it's taking a terrible toll. It's it's literally eating away deeper inside. And there's so many examples of this um, that have shown that epigenetically, or indeed just um, from a, a, a physiological point of view, some of this idea that our resilience, our persistence has no consequences. I think if parents understood that the long-term consequences of having a child persist when it's, you know, it just is taking so much effort. At some point, that child risks breaking down. And we see that at universities sometimes where these, you know, the high flyers who come in out of, you know, they beat the odds, as we say, they get to university. And then after the a year or two, they just crash and burn. They, you know, they self-harm, they suicide, God forbid, I don't want that to happen. But the, even just diabetes, heart problems, um, nervous anxiety disorders, they sort of, they just sort of overwhelm. And I think sometimes, again, we, we forget that our resilience is tied up with the resilience of the systems around us. So if you're going to push a child that far, or you're going to come out of that kind of poverty or that kind of background, you're going to need the supports as well of a community of concern. And to be fair, re universities have realized this because now we have often for populations that demonstrate this, you know, pattern of, you know, excessive toil to get where they are. We now have a lot of extra supports there to flood people with, with extra help so that when they finally get into these stressful contexts, we don't just leave them to, you know, to sort of swim on their own. Um, we understand that maybe getting there used up a lot of personal resources. And I found that thought kind of different than the way we normally think about resilience. You're resilient, you're resilient forever. But that's actually maybe not the case. So along those lines then, what does a healthy or balanced approach to resilience, especially for parents trying to teach this to their kids, what should it include? What does it look like? Well, I think what it looks like is understanding that your child's resilience is caught up with the resilience of others around them. So, you know, a good teacher is going to help your child a lot. So making sure that, you know, this, if you have any influence on the school community and that teachers are, you know, well compensated, that they don't have to buy markers and coloring supplies for their students, and that, you know, we adequately resource those kinds of spaces and that we adequately resource our communities and we encourage our children to have contact, not just with us, but a network of aunties and uncles and, you know, and, and neighbors and other resources. And we, 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 you know, we, we negotiate with a child how much activity they want and what is good about them. And while we encourage them and we do set structure and expectations for homework and for, you know, that they practice the piano and all those other things that we should do, but that we also read the room a little bit when they're super resistant to that, that we understand that sometimes maybe we're pushing too hard and that maybe that very product that we're trying to get, we're going to undermine and destroy unless we also understand that sometimes different children need different pacing and different expectations. So what can we do? We can kind of negotiate a bit with our child. We can open up lots of opportunities and we can make sure that the systems, other systems besides just us are helping our child become the best possible person that they can be. Dr. Unger, what would you like readers of The Limits of Resilience to leave with from your book? Hmm. Maybe just a little more conceptual, like a little more clarity that when they use that word resilience, they are talking about a process, 
They're talking about systems. And maybe we we get away from just this individual conversation about you bounced back. And we much more say, you know, I give an example of, of um, you know, I was doing some work with uh, one of the large Fortune 500s that has one of the superstars of soccer that came out of incredible poverty. Um, and just to get away from the idea that, you know, that that soccer star did it all on his own. He came out of the favelas and he, you know, he somehow succeeds all on his own. And much more understanding that somebody gave him a soccer ball, probably gave him a second soccer ball after he destroyed the first one. And somebody helped him get to a special training camp and some community and some family members, you know, coalesced around and saw something special in that child. Those are the things I think that are actually going to make it incredibly important for a child to be successful. Lots of certainly important food for thought for the, the days and the lives of, that we're living right now in our current world. Dr. Yes. Michael Unger, resilience researcher, therapist, and author of The Limits of Resilience. Thank you so much for your time and your insight today. Really appreciate it. You're very welcome. A real pleasure.